Dr. Ian, can you hear me loud and clear? All right. Uh, all right. So, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to all all the attendees today. So, it has been a good uh, uh, previous sessions we had uh, on our new initiative of AdMix, which started uh, during this lockdown and uh, we had really good audience we had more than 2500 plus people who have attended our webinars so we have conducted uh, more than 15 webinars till now and uh, we started with uh, some simple additive manufacturing guidance and that was uh, starting from the 3d printing 101 and then it was from to the advanced additive manufacturing where we talked about topology optimization conformer cooling am and the quality and the maintenance requirement mm -hmm. of additive manufacturing itself so so a lot of uh, uh, people have been invited in our webinars and today also uh, we have uh, mr paul from spare parts 3d dr ian Halliday, uh, who is ex ceo of 3d am uh, Mr. Athaur Rahman Khan from Scient. So, so, so this new session, uh, starting with today's uh, webinar itself, how to be an informed AM buyer. So every Thursday we'll be doing a new set of webinars itself. So the second one will will be on pre and the post uh, AM requirements, uh, the design side, the quality side, and the traceability side. And then after that we'll be talking about the AM materials. So, what are these additive manufacturing materials? How to characterize those materials? How to develop them and test them according to your applications? And then we'll be doing a webinar on aerospace space and the defense application of additive manufacturing, which has been taking additive manufacturing as a one one of the serious manufacturing technologies uh, for for their requirement. And this is how we have been. Uh, progressing uh, on our webinar. So my name is Ankit Sahu. Uh, I am the co-founder and the director of Objective Fire Technologies. It is my pleasure to welcome you all uh, onto this webinar. And uh, uh, so, so good afternoon to everyone. So as as I have already mentioned to you uh, about uh, our previous webinars, uh, so Innovators at Home, which was done during the lockdown one in India. And it was one of a kind uh, webinar where we introduced the technology from the software side, from the material side, from the machine side, and we talked about different way you can adopt the technology. And then we talked about the topology, uh, the conformer cooling, uh, and the oil and gas sector, how it has been benefiting out of um, the technology itself. Then. Uh, in late June, we did uh, absolute basics, mostly for the um, audience, um, student audience, and it was uh, for most of the engineering student bachelor's degree, and it was done in in more concentrated way uh, to enable all the young engineers coming into the field post COVID uh, pandemic, and the pandemic has also given us an opportunity to present ourselves, showcase our knowledge, showcase our thoughts about uh, adopting a new technology. And we have been inviting panel uh, from across the globe. And uh, so that's how this idea has uh, begun. And it has been a great pleasure. So, so today's webinar is on how to be an informed AM buyer. And uh, our, our association partner is Tagma India and media partner is 3dprint.com. Um, so, so this has been a basic question, like uh, everybody wants to be involved in the additive manufacturing field, but uh, they don't know from where to start and from where to start asking the right questions uh, from the machine manufacturer, from a service bureau like us, uh, from a material development side, from the software side, how to initiate that, that kind of an activity and we what we have realized is that uh, the most important thing for additive manufacturing is the bespoke solutions we can provide uh, to the consumers so that's why this initiative from objectify we have taken 
to de decipher debunk uh, the topic of being an informed am buyer because uh, this is something really important for any of the organization in their strategic decision making or implementing a new technology into into their ecosystem itself so so we should also understand about what kind what is a requirement so, so we should know uh, how to define a requirement and requirement is something as we all are coming from an engineering background and we know having constrained boundary of delivering us uh, delivering something is better than uh, starting from scratch we are not artists so we need to know better uh, from where the requirements are coming so so we need to understand from um, application to the material used to the technology you are asking for so so it is a, a, a lengthy subjective topic so we need to understand better uh, about about the topic itself so so the requirements come to a company like objectify in in these five forms uh, one is the prototype so people people ask sorry people ask for uh, uh, prototyping requirement be it in metal uh, be it in polymer they want functional prototypes uh, which can be working in their application itself it should not be just uh, a visual prototype or a, a, a just a dimensional check prototype so it, it should be functional in their application itself some people come to us for a small batch production so be it a small uh, iot company who just like sorry hello Preeti. Uh, Sankar. Sankar, can you check? Hello. So, so we have been doing reverse engineering um, as a service. We also talk about the spare parts and the MRO components for our customers. And uh, this is one of the basic and the most important uh, application of additive manufacturing. We will be talking in deep about these topics uh, as we go, go ahead. So there are certain prerequisites of defining an AM requirement itself. So first is the design. Uh, you should know what, what exactly you want to uh, get made out of additive manufacturing. So you should have a design which should have a 3D generated model, uh, which, which is in a computer aided design format and you should know what what are the tolerances what are the geometric uh, variation you you is acceptable for your application itself then you should be able to identify correct materials and uh, the specification of the uh, material according to your application itself and then you should know about the quantities required and the delivery time and the most important thing is the application end application of the component itself and that's how you define and keep everything in one single uh, requirement format and the most important part uh, of selecting additive manufacturing is also the budget uh, you are working with so so budget everything comes down to money and if you are dealing with a lot of businesses then budgets is one of the key driver of the technology itself uh, that's how people have been taking over the technology and uh, lastly, uh, if uh, somebody wants to take a decision of uh, trying to understand what are the benefits of additive manufacturing on the convention technology, it's the lead time, the quality, and the cost. So these are the three uh, uh, dimensions where everything comes around. So lead time, there are uh, benefits in the preform fabrication, digital inventory, shorter supply chain, reduced lead time, and the distributed manufacturing you can go ahead with on the quality side you can choose good strength materials you can have a digital data driven automation and uh, you can have traceability and business sustainability through am you don't have to keep a lot of parts made and to be used later on you can do it on the go um, so on the cost side your costs get get saved when you have a very complex design to be done and uh, you have very high mix of low volume components to be done 
then you have a lot of customized parts. So MROs are something uh, where you can still increase the efficiency of the system and you can go ahead uh, with realizing these uh, components um, with lesser amount of investment. So because of the low or no tooling costs required uh, for additive manufacturing and it is also one of a key technology for reduction of waste and uh, to reduce the low process cost. So there are certain uh, uh, tangents you can draw from the current materials uh, used in the conventional side to the 3D printing materials. Uh, mostly right now I'm talking about the metal side. So there are certain tool steels which are available in the 3D printing space, which are similar to what you use in uh, uh, the conventional way of manufacturing, then the stainless steels, the aluminums, the titaniums, uh, the nickels and the copper alloys. So copper alloys are taking a good uh, standpoint in the market right now because of the great application in the space and the electric vehicles uh, space and people are taking additive manufacturing as a serious uh, enabler of uh, adoption of these uh, uh, electric vehicles itself and the cobalt chromes. So, so when you are selecting materials on the polymer side, you select your materials according to the strength, transparency, water, water resistance and temperature. Uh, so, so you can find these materials uh, which uh, complement your requirement according to like polyamide, glass field, to Acura 60, uh, to SOMOS Evolve 128 and for temperature you have polyamide flame retardant. And um, so, so these are like certain materials which you can choose according to your application and end use. So, so you can have a better selection of going forward with these uh, this technology as an adopted point uh, point of start. So again, uh, on the metal side, again you can choose according to your end application. If you require a lot of strength in your component, you can uh, work with the nickel superalloys, titanium for um, weight to efficiency ratio uh, efficiency to weight ratio temperature resistance high temperature alloys like ion 718 ion 625 uh, cm 247 which is one of the key crown jewel of additive manufacturing people have been trying to develop on this uh, um, technology currently uh, uh, corrosion resistance uh, like 17-4 uh, ss 316l um, Strength to weight ratio in Ti64, Cobalt Chrome, and LSI 10MG. On the tooling side, you use Maradin steel and different kind of tooling steels like S13. Uh, refractory alloys like tungsten. Um, similar to the aluminum die casting, you can use LSI 10MG. Super alloys like ion 718, ion 625, hash alloy X can be used. By compatibility can also be judged through uh, titanium alloys, Cobalt Chrome alloys, and SS316L. And the conductive alloys like copper, CUCR, ZR, uh, ZR kind of things. So you need to understand how to make a decision over it. So, so these are like four points how you take a decision on selecting a technology. First is the form and fit. Uh, then is the high strength, or what kind of strength you're looking for. Then the special properties like chemical resistance, heat, flame re resistance, or biocompatibility is one of your requirement. Then is the flexibility. If only elongation is required or if you want a soft rubber like material then you can select a different technology and different material for your application itself. Um, so I'm just going ahead with one of the example. This is a jet engine. Uh, so how you can define your uh, bill of material according to the additive manufacturing uh, technology itself. So so just, just out of thought. So these are some of the components already developed at uh, Objectify. So we have done flame tubes in ion 6 to 5. The lead time was reduced from six months to six weeks. So it is kind of a great achievement. And uh, the better part uh, with this was uh, we were able to execute uh, this project with uh, low, less amount of welding requirement. Otherwise, people used to go with different technologies where the welding seam lines were quite high. So, so you can have an integrated design. So this was one of the key benefit of using the additive technologies then the casing part for the shrouds and the everything you can use LSI 10 mg and uh, which will be a great benefit for one of uh, one of or five of components 
then uh, complex geometries like uh, low pressure turbine blades it is one of a very good technology to produce these blades uh, uh, in titanium or in canals or ss actually and on the injection molding side you can work on on uh, uh, with marathon steel so so all in all you can you can select the materials according to their component and their applications and there is an answer for your business case or the business strategy you want to develop with and uh, secondly we wanted to take uh, you through the polymer additive manufacturing so so we have taken like five points of our ev so this is one of our customers uh, we have done development projects for them uh, and ev is one of the uh, hot topic right now in the market and uh, these are like some of the components like headlamp the the display the battery covers the seat mounts and uh, and the battery terminals so you so you can select uh, different available additive manufacturing technologies like sla sls and uh, you can you can define these uh, properties to your uh, end use and you can move further according to your selection of the material and uh, so currently we are working on some of the project where the volumes are so low for these evs because the customer wants to evaluate uh, his his hypothesis on the selection of the vehicle so so rather than going for the direct tooling so he's taking these 3d printed components from us and directly using it uh, for their end use application itself and uh, post processing is also one of the most important part of our data manufacturing so generally we for for dmls component uh, powder bed fusion we do heat treatment support removal short painting and uh, additionally we can do machining we can do abrasive flow machining electro polishing uh, the the high high grade polishing also like mmp sla we we generally do um, the support removal and uh, cleaning and uh, we we can also paint these part like in sls also so there are certain derivative uh, benefits of additive manufacturing like in conformer cooling so we have done to more than 200 plus injection molding uh, tooling projects where we we were able to reduce the cycle time of the injection mold uh, just not the injection mold but also die casting so we were able to reduce more than like 40 to 60% of the current cooling time of these components then for small batch very small batch production like from 5 to 25 vacuum casting is one of the good examples of your uh, indirect application of additive manufacturing where you produce a sla master then produce subsequent uh, parts uh, through a silicon rubber mold then uh, on the investment casting side you print uh, a, a pattern of for for invest, investment casting and then subsequent uh, casting can be done in materials of your choice like you know, nickel super alloys titaniums and the aluminums so this is right now widely used as a technology so i just wanted to bring a couple of examples of selection of the technology according to the cost lead time and the material selection itself so this is the covid 19 headband which has been widely used globally people have used the additive technologies for realizing these headbands uh, for face shields and uh, so as i have mentioned in my presentation itself uh, for selecting of four different technologies like fdm sls vacuum casting and injection molding what are the benefits of going further so be it uh, the 3d printing technologies like sls and fdm being expensive uh, than the injection molding but but the lead time is so short that if you require only one then you can just print it and you can use it for yourself if uh, there is a certain requirement of like uh, if you want to just have it for your family itself and you have one week of time uh, then you can choose the vacuum casting technology it becomes a cheaper process but not as cheap as injection molding but your uh, project is done during a week's time so so you are saving a lot on, on the time front so so this is how you select a technology for your end application this is how you move forward with your application itself so, so second example is on the metal side so investment casting of this closed impeller is one of the example where people have been generally using investment casting and for investment casting there is an upfront uh, investment cost uh, on the pattern itself a pattern which can also be manufactured 
you know through additive manufacturing as i told you in the previous slide but there is a good amount of moq requirement there is a good lead time of six to seven weeks but if you take uh, take an example of one or two uh, uh close impellers required for your application you can choose powder bed fusion dmls technology where the cost cost per close impeller will be between 5000 to 7000 uh, usd and uh, the minimum quantity can be as low as one or two and the realization time will be very less of uh, one to two weeks so so the quick turnaround time the application the go to use uh, is the value creator for this technology itself and that's how it has been uh, getting getting attracted to the end users itself so today we have uh, uh, the panel uh, dr ian holiday uh, from uh, um, tamsco um, he's along with us uh, he's ex uh, 3t am uh, ceo um, he has joined us from uk uh, uh, mr paul uh, he has joined us from france he is the ceo and the founder of space path 3d and uh, mr athaur rahman uh, who is the director of additive manufacturing technology at Scient? So, so if we want Dr. Ian, can you hear me? I think Dr. Ian has some speak. Dr. Ian. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. <laughs> All right, I've tried two different devices. So I'm now speaking to the group, yeah? Yes, yes, we can hear you loud. So Dr. Ian, if you want to introduce yourself, uh, it is a great pleasure uh, to invite you for this uh, webinar. So so as, as rightly mentioned, you have a vast experience in the additive manufacturing space. Uh, so you have been running one of the most successful uh, service bureaus around the globe. So, so if you want to add on to your introduction. Um, thank you very much. Uh, well, I appreciate time short, so I'll just keep my part very quick. Uh, so yes, I've, I've been involved in uh, additive manufacturing for 30 or so years. Um, it's uh, been a very exciting journey um, of uh, maintained a high level of uh, excitement about potential for additive manufacturing and it's always a pleasure to um, be able to talk to people about uh, how they can uh, make the most of the technology. Um, most of my most recent experience mm -hmm. really running 3T and um, I'll go on to the main part of my presentation I think um, to um, go into the, uh, the main body of what I'm do doing. So, um, just some thoughts on the topic for relating to um, buying parts, and um, I'm really assuming that um, those uh, these comments relate to most people who are speaking to less experienced users. Um, it's most important to understand the additive manufacturing benefits before you really get into um, buying parts, procuring parts from suppliers, um, and that process starts with educating yourself by perhaps um, going to shows or seminars or whatever and your objective overall is to be what could be referred to as a smart customer so you're not um, just going in there and everything's uh, rather dazzling when you talk to your supplier you can go in there with uh, some confidence which is uh, something I certainly find helpful when I'm uh, buying a new, a new whatever it might be so understand the benefits, but also understand the drawbacks um, of additive manufacturing, because there are plenty of drawbacks, but you, should, you can get around most of them if you choose. Hello. Hello. Hello, Dr. Ian. Oh, we are having some, I think, technical difficulties with Dr. Ian. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, he's he's now. Uh, oh. he's, uh, yeah, he'll be joining in. 
he's joining in from from his uh, phone so i'll just uh, he's just giving me a call uh hello yes right so choosing the right part um this is really very very important to uh, to make sure that you're choosing the right part so the best bits typically have uh, multiple benefits that you can gain. So mass saving, um, speed of manufacture, uh, improvements in uh, performance and so on, as per the diagram that um, Ankit showed earlier. Um, equally, the wrong parts can give you a fair bit of pain. So if you um, determine the uh, go ahead and choose a part which um, really isn't well suited to AM, it'll um, possibly um, cause you failures down the line, be more expensive, not prove the technology, and uh, might even set you back um, years. I've seen cases where customers have done that, and um, it's uh, more than a painful process to get back. The key part within that is taking your time and, and goes painstakingly from 1 to 10, as it were, so uh, rather than 1, 2, 3, 10. Um, if you jump steps, uh, then uh, typically um, your risk goes up. So this is something that uh, David Wimpany mentioned in, in the last seminar. Mm -hmm. Then you go on to choosing the right technologies for the parts, um, and um, it's natural to uh, it's a natural follow-on really from understanding the benefits. Um, so not all parts, not all processes are made equal from the point of view of the component, and you just need to decide based on the benefits which is the right process for you. And I think it's just gone through some of that. Um, but for example, powder bed is excellent for high detail, high resolution, or complexity with small holes and channels. But um, a blown powder type process might be best suited to rapid de deposition and very large parts, but not be any good for holes and channels. So that really goes then hand in hand with choosing the right supplier. Um, now, a good supplier will help you through the process. Um, they may have a single technology, and if it's not suited to what you want, then um, <clears throat> they'll tell you and say, well, look, this is, we think the right technology is a different one, it's X, Y, Z, um, and if you've got something to suit us, then, then great. But that, if it's the right one, then fantastic. They'll, give, they'll have a high level of technical competence. Uh, they'll be able to assist with the design for additive manufacturing. They'll be easy to deal with. Uh, they have a complete process chain, most likely. And they have an excellent um, reputation for quality and uh, quality standards. Mind you, the best supplier may not be the cheapest, of course, but uh, in the long run, they probably will end up being the cheapest overall. Yeah. So moving on to um, design for AM. Um, so the uh, any part you choose, you can almost certainly reduce the mass or improve the build time, um, improve the performance by designing for taking advantage of uh, additive manufacturing. And you can probably also combine parts together. Mm -hmm. Finally, once you've uh, done all of that, then um, the important thing is to uh, review what you've done, what you've done, learn from it, and then move on so that you can um, multiply the benefits through your business. And um, that then can give you the opportunity to look at the final point, which is working towards system level uh, design for additive manufacturing. So General GE are um, probably the global leader for uh, metal AM use. Um, that is what they do. They look at the whole system and treat additive manufacturing as just one of the many processes that um, you, can, you have available for manufacturing. So um, those are my key points. Um, I hope that's been helpful. Sorry about the audio problems. and. Um, I wish you all the very best in your exploitation of the technology. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ian. I'll, I'll just get back to you uh, after introducing everybody else also. Uh, can you just okay. hold on Thank to you. the line? Yes. Thanks. Yes. Uh, so that was Dr. Ian's uh, thought. So I, I would also like to introduce uh, uh, Mr. Paul Golimot. Uh, so Mr. Paul uh, is the founder and the direct uh, CEO of Space Part 3D and it is based out of France and it is on-demand production. Um, and uh, he has been at the forefront of adoption of additive manufacturing. So he, his insights are more than welcome. Uh, so uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Paul, can you hear me? Yes, hello Ankit. Do yes. you hear me well? How are you? Yes, yes. 
Good. Thanks. Thanks a lot for introducing and thank you for giving the uh, giving me the the time to to present a little bit um, you know, our insights on the topic. Um, so maybe just uh, I present myself uh, quite fast and, and dig into uh, um, what we know and and I'll focus on how to be inform AM better, but mostly for the spare part topic, which is our our really expertise. Sure. Uh, so myself, um, I'm uh, uh, French. I'm based in France. Uh, have been in the in the AM field for five years now. Um, I've got a background of mechanical indu industrial engineering, and I've been strategic consultant my my beginning of career uh, with Oliver Wyman, um, and a spin-off of McKinsey and Oliver Wyman. Um, so I'm, I'm really I've worked my entire career only in, in the industry and uh, and I was willing to come back to to AM back in 2015, knowing that the, the technologies were booming uh, and the technology was development were booming, but at the same time, the the application within the industry were very more scarce and uh, it was difficult to find exactly how to leverage uh, AM for for different application and especially with regard to the capabilities to distribute production um, so we decided to work on on, on producing spare parts uh, for various industries and um, and maybe what, what i would like to introduce is a little bit the spare part problem because uh, you've presented uh, earlier on some of your cases and uh, and and the problem the problem with spare parts is when you're a spare part manager or reseller spare parts or, or, or an industrial uh, doing maintenance on on, uh, on a system, uh, managing spare parts is usually a nightmare and it's a cost. And you're always trying to do trade off in between having availability of, that, of parts, uh, which means having a high inventory, or risking to have shortages. So you're trying to do the, the less worse uh, solutions that you can, that you can get. And you are limited very often by the fact that your supply chain for spare parts is, is not specifically done for spare parts. It's done for first-man product. And therefore, sometimes and very often inadapted to produce low quantity and demands and deliver it quickly. So you end up having MOQ, uh, minimal order quantities that are high. So the case, especially on plastics, you end up having lead time to delivery that are high when we are talking about on-demand order production, which makes it uh, a complex and, and a very interesting field uh, for on-demand production with AM. And um, I, I, I would like to address a little bit what the, the business cases that we see uh, on spare parts. And um, everyone, or I'll say uh, most of our customers and, and people working the AM field see the opportunity uh, of producing spare for AM related to the stock and uh, ability to reduce stock. But if we go a little bit into the details of the, of the business cases, uh, we usually found uh, three types, three big uh, areas of, of, of problems. Uh, I'd say my, the first one is, is related to obsolescence. So uh, obsolescence is uh, whenever you are unable to reproduce a part, because if you are producing plastics, you have lost the mold or broken the mold. Um, or simply because your supplier is no longer existing. Uh, that happens very often on, on industrial equipment systems uh, with, with assets that, are, that are, have a very, very long uh, duration time. So like in railway, uh, nuclear power plants, uh, energy in general. Um, then the second business case is, is, is uh, shortening lead times. Um, a good example is around metal parts that are coming from casting or forging. Uh, these mm -hmm. conventional processes are often very long lead time to procure, um, and, and the ability to produce parts and and not necessarily reproduce. Uh, I, I'm always supportive of design for additive manufacturing when there is a business case to to do so. Um, the ability to produce these parts on demand with shorter lead time can have a, a drastic impact, uh, especially when it comes to uh, uh, shortening uh, the impact on the, or, or reducing the impact of the business by shortening the, the delivery time. And the last one is on the stock, and on the stock, when you when you think about it, so the problem is, is, is very often related to um, MOQs uh, in reorders, so uh, reducing reorder value, reducing the cash 
uh, going out on the reorder uh, on reorder values, and uh, and uh, eventually, uh, and we see that in, in lot of uh, with a lot of industrials, uh, providing the ability to scrap part of the inventory and being able to shift to an on-demand production uh, method again because you can lower your MOQ, yeah. and uh, the economics can be quite 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 impressive with this. Um, so, so that's not. Uh, also, we are talking about scrapping, and that's usually a risk. But that's not a business case to be forgotten. And generally speaking, uh, what we see is that there are quite a lot of difficulties to to be able to apply these business cases. And as 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 Yain said just earlier, the, the one of the real problems is to find parts. And 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 finding parts is is difficult because it means finding parts from a technical perspective. Uh, as well as from an economical one. So finding this part that will be in this business case as I just mentioned, but at the same time, um, having the ability to do the process that uh, Hankit you described uh, at the beginning of, of, the, of your conference, which is from the specification to the solution. Uh, how, can I, how can I address that from a, a systematic standpoint when I have 100,000 of spare parts to be able to um, find the right parts to, to work on. And, and usually uh, what we see is that uh, customers and companies, industrial companies that are looking on spare parts employ uh, 3D printing companies, uh, mm -hmm. uh, OEM makers, service bureau that comes in uh, to help provide their expertise on finding spare parts. And that works well, uh, that works very well in, in, finding, uh, in finding parts in, in the order of magnitude of the hundreds, I'll say. But that makes mm -hmm. that, that 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 can become a difficulty when it comes to scale, and actually that's our business. That's what we do at Spare Part 3D. So uh, we've got uh, solutions called DigiPart that that helps to to standardize uh, and automate this process from specification to uh, business casing with uh, everything around costing, uh, identification of the business cases, um, and then. Of course, you you end up having business cases or not when you know exactly what's going to be your lead time and what's going to be your production prices. So that's where uh, working cross collaboration with uh, with uh, with service bureau for us is essential, and 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 having a, a, a consistent sourcing and supply base uh, with AM um, is a challenge today uh, for 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 a lot of companies. But is is a, an important requirement as well to be able to to get the, the best out of uh, of of AM. Um, exactly. Yeah, that's pretty much all I wanted to introduce. I'm happy to to discuss sure. further and, and answer question if yeah. any. Yes, uh, uh, Mr. Paul, I'll I'll just come back to you after introducing uh, Mr. Atul Rahman. Yes, I'll sure. Come back to you. Yes. So I also have uh, Mr. Atul Rahman Khan uh, from Scient India. Uh, so he's the director of additive manufacturing technology in India, and he was a scientist at ISRO. And he's a good friend. He's a good uh, customer and a collaborator with Objectify. We have been working for almost one and a half year together, and we have dealt with a lot of problems or problem statements from their end customers. So he'll be happy to express his views onto the topic. Uh, so Arthur, sir, can you? Thank you, Ankit. Uh, quick check on the audio. Uh, yes, am I audible? You're audible. Yes. Okay, great. Um, good evening, good morning, everyone. My name is Ataur Rahman. Uh, I'm currently the director of uh, Additive Manufacturing Business at Scient. Um, I started my career at uh, Indian Space Research Organization as a scientist there. And I was working on solid propulsion systems as well as some uh ground testing facilities for nozzles for high altitude applications uh, that was the time that i first got introduced to uh additive manufacturing in a practical sense right and uh it kind of stuck with me uh since then although my roles have been uh, out of engineering after that so i worked at indian space research organization for about five years and after that i worked in business roles as a senior business consultant at Cognizant, where I was uh, a part of their manufacturing and logistics uh, uh, vertical in their consulting business. And then I worked with uh, a couple of startups uh, in leadership roles. Uh, one was in uh, education space, 
and the other one was in healthcare. And after that, uh, I joined Scient. Uh, when Scient was planning of establishing uh, their additive manufacturing uh, formally inside the company as a new function. I've been with Sign for about two and a half years now, and I've seen uh, the additive manufacturing business at Sign grow from its very initial days. So that's a little bit about myself. Now about the company, uh, Sign. Yes, thank you, Ankit. Yes. So uh, I'll start off with uh, briefly explaining about what we do so that uh, you have the context of uh, the rest of the things that uh, uh, I share with you. So Scient is a solutions provider to uh, clients from across industries. Uh, this ranges from aerospace and defense to energy, to medical, uh, transportation, heavy equipment, and many other industries. So what we do, what we have been traditionally doing is we provide design solutions to our clients. And in some cases, we also do low volume manufacturing. We have in-house electronic manufacturing capabilities as well as precision mechanical manufacturing facilities. Now, with this in mind, uh, the perspective that I want to bring on the table today is as a solutions provider or as a buyer of services from additive manufacturing service bureaus and as a seller of services and solutions to your clients um, from various who can be various OEMs or tier ones across industries. What are the things that uh, we should be talking about when we talk about being an informed AM buyer? So some of the things. Uh, uh, that uh, that I have uh, uh, considered in our journey so far is when you're engaging someone in a business relationship, uh, it's good to be clear from the start if that relationship is going to be a partnership or is it going to be a transactional relationship? Because that would dictate uh, the kind of effort and the time that you would invest uh, with your business engagement uh, with that particular partner. The other things to consider is for services, for example, what are the various ways in which you can do benchmarking of different vendors? And how would you select a vendor from a pool of vendors? How would you design the proof of concept parts and frameworks for communication? Ankit was earlier mentioning about requirements. So what, what framework would you uh, follow to formalize those requirements? How would you define defects and deviations for uh, an additive product, right? And how would you how would you qualify the expertise of your partner in, in post-processing, testing? How would you, for example, rate their maturity in additive manufacturing? Do, would you use the TRL levels as a, as a benchmark or a barometer, or would you, would you design a separate scale altogether? So these are some of the things that, that we need to consider when we are talking about uh, services. Now, when you're considering buying simulation tools, again, you need to start with deciding how do you benchmark different simulation tools that are available in the market? How do you check if that particular tool is compatible with your customer's uh, processes and customer's requirements? Is the tool interoperable with some of the CAD tools uh, that, that your customer might be using? What's the accuracy? And does the tool have all the features that uh, today constitute the state of the art? Now coming to materials, I think this is very straightforward. Uh, you look at uh, what costs you can get when you're trying to source materials in bulk. You look at lead times, the uh, customs and costs involved. You look at reactive materials, how to store them, how to dispose them. You look at metals and polymers and what metals and polymers uh, would you work with uh, from your long-term point of view. And you look at the form of raw materials. So uh, it is also possible for you to uh, uh, buy the uh, raw material in its primitive form and have a supplier here uh, make those filaments for you. So that could be another option. Mm -hmm. The third thing that you look at when, when you're talking about 3D printing systems itself, uh, what you see on the technical spec sheet is really what you get in practical use. So how do you benchmark different machines with respect to their technical specification and actual performance? How do you, how do you decide on the expenses uh, that you need to incur on the facility, the AMCs, the spare part lead time for the machine themselves, and what are the various warranties uh, that you need to consider when you're uh, uh, planning of buying a machine or buying the machine. And the last one is the most important one, in my opinion, from a design point of view, 
so as a solution provider or as an OEM, when you give a design of an additively manufactured part or a conventional part for a service bureau or one of your partners, either for redesign or for direct uh, manufacturing and additive manufacturing, who owns the IP? And the IP can come in various forms. It could be a design-related IP. It could be a process-related IP. So uh, one of the things to consider when you're uh, buying for AM, uh, especially services, is you need to be very clear that you have defined uh, this particular aspect uh, right at the start of the engagement. Now, the second section on the slide, and I will go through this uh, uh, really fast, is basically uh, 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 a little bit more specific. That is, when you are, what additional requirements do you need to be really careful about when you are buying uh, an additive manufacturing service, not for yourself, but maybe for your customer. So in that case, you need to absolutely ensure that the requirements are crystallized very, very well, because uh, this can lead to a lot of problems later on. You need to ensure that your uh, service bureau or the partner is complying with the certifications that the customer may require. You need to define the acceptance criteria for a part. For example, the confidence intervals on the tensile strength what is the acceptable level? What are the acceptable levels of surface finish tolerances, etc.? These need to be defined very, very well uh, in advance, uh, and these need to be uh, discussed and finalized. Then qualification of the machine and the process, right? PQR as well as MQR. These are these are two aspects that need to be critically looked at, so that uh, you can have some confidence on on your production process once you move to production. Um, is there a warranty that the that the manufacturer can issue on the service life of the parts? And what are the other suppliers' warranties and buyers' risk uh, that that can be there? For example, uh, if you have a high mix, low volume uh, set of components that you're sourcing uh, from a uh, from one of your partners, <clears throat> who bears the cost of the failure of the component, right? And uh, so these are things that need to be discussed and framed into several rate contracts as well as partnership agreements when you're looking at uh, buying for uh, additive manufacturing. So I hope uh, I could add some uh, additional perspective. And with that, uh, I would uh, pass it over to you, Ankit. Thank you so much, Atha, sir. Uh, it was a great insight uh, from uh, engineering service providers like Cyan and a thought how to buy and how to go forward with it. So uh, when we start the panel discussion in the in my next slide, uh, Sanka, can you put on the poll, please? Uh, we have just a short poll just to make sure like what kind of on, on audience we are with. Uh, so Sanka? Uh, yes, uh, am I audible? Yes. Uh, so yes, uh, I'll be running a couple of polls, just three polls, uh, one after the other. I would request everyone to please uh, jam in your answers. The first poll, yes. Is on your screen right now i would request everyone to please give in your answers so in the meantime dr ian can you check your microphone if it is working now? um dr. Ian? okay can you hear me now yes, yes loud and clear <laughs> <laughs> so it has been quite a challenge so uh, when people are answering this poll, uh, so I would like to um, invite you to the panel today's discussion. So I have a few questions uh, already framed for all the three panelists. So uh, I would like to start with Dr. Ian itself because uh, I think uh, between all of us, you have the most amount of experience of dealing with customers, how to get a revenue out of the customer, how to be, have a satisfactory customer. So, quite a uh, journey uh, can you hear me yes I can hear yes so uh, yes. sorry what was the question so, so so my question is uh, in your experience how have you seen the transition of a customer uh, and, and his his or hers adoption of the technology itself uh, in the in the course of your career itself so can you can you just throw some light of your uh, customers uh, evolve evolution um yeah sure um thank you the uh, pretty much everybody goes through the the same basic steps whether it's um uh, additive manufacturing uptake or any other technology um to begin with you and in fact you can see some of this if you look at the gartner um hype curve uh, it gives you a rough idea but initially it um 
you're exploring the technology and at that phase it may well be uh, amazing it can do everything it's going to solve all the problems which of course no technology ever does it it's, may solve some but creates other problems and then you go through a, a, a series of stages of gradual uptake um, where you might just try getting a part made and then that's where some of the points are made about purchasing um, and uh, we're just made now about purchasing behavior are very important um, just to take it a step at a time um, and then you go through and perhaps have a company strategy you may even have an in-house uh, team for additive manufacturing which is then very helpful to the supplier because that in-house team does the the hard work internally um, hopefully they're, they're you know knowledgeable and keen which they usually are um, and then eventually you go through to production um, if that's what your your goal is and then of course uh, GE is the, the ultimate example of uh, systems integration and uh, systems design thinking in, in terms of success those that succeed are uh, generally a bit more cautious than those that don't uh, those that don't hype it up internally are more successful and those that follow the steps one two three four five six seven eight nine ten Perhaps a little boring, a little bit unexciting, but uh, in the end, it's a lot faster to go a bit slower. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, I, I'll have my second question with uh, Mr. Paul. Uh, can you help us uh, with your big, uh, unique business idea of just going to a specific markets on the spare parts and just uh, working on the development of these spare parts uh, for your end customers and your involvement with the service bureaus, as you have already mentioned about it? and maintaining that quality standards with uh, uh, your uh, customers itself. So, Mr. Paul? Uh, yes, thank you, Ankit. Um, I mean, in terms of the spare parts, um, I, regarding the, the objectives and, and how to, what what's the leverage that you can use with, with AM, I've kind of already talk, quite introduced that earlier on. Um, what, what, what our point of view is, is uh, what, what we are providing is kind of being solution provider to help industrials to to scale that to the to the to the spare part business, knowing that oh, every time you need to do an analysis, uh, every time you need to you want to do a technology transfer for a given part, um, it's 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 some work in terms of engineering, in terms of uh, purchasing. And, and because uh, for spare parts, you, the value of, 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 of AM is to do it for, for high mix, low volumes of parts, uh, you need to systematize this uh, to be able to, to have a ROI, basically. Else, you spend too much engineering compared to the cost savings that you're going to get uh, out of your parts. So that's, that's, what, that's basically what we are doing. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of the, the, the production, the sourcing, uh, I, I cannot agree more than what uh, Mr. Atta and Yang have said. It's just uh, um, being crystal clear on the requirements and uh, have everything written down uh, in terms of what what your expectations from uh, from the from from the technologies that you're going to be using uh, is very important. It's quite difficult today because there is no standard still or, or very limited standards on the on the AM technologies and with the different materials. But it's it's extremely important to align uh, whether we are for us, whether it is with the customers of or with the suppliers, uh, the contractor, to or regarding the specifications that we're gonna that we're gonna target uh, to make sure that there is no misalignment. And and quite often um, it means that uh, when we are talking about the spare parts, it means that having laid down clearly what is the specification required for the spare parts. Uh, in terms of, uh, you mentioned a few examples in terms of corrosion, tensile, uh, tolerancing, a and this is this is a groundwork uh, that that is difficult. That that is quite easy to be done on new product. That is more difficult on 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 reordering of of, of parts, um, but that is absolutely essential to make sure that there is no no no, no difficulty uh, down the, down the road. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so like, uh, I'll, I'll have my second, uh, the next question with uh, Mr. Arthur. So, um, from the design side, uh, as you have been doing a lot of legacy design work for a lot of big customers like Pratt and Whitney, uh, like Boeing, Lockheed Martin. So, so how do you see uh, from the design perspective 
to adopt additive manufacturing as one of the solution for realizing those components uh, uh, that's a good question ankit so i think uh, uh, traditionally the customers uh, in the aerospace industry uh, we have found them to be very very uh, cautious and uh, conservative uh, because of the safety uh, aspects that are involved uh, in in their most of their end applications so uh, also uh, hello uh, atha sir can you unmute yourself again Yes, enough. Hello. Uh, Thank you, sir. Yes. Yes, Ankit. Yes, please go ahead. Actually. Yep. So, um, so I think uh, the the challenge is where uh, the design is done, and you need to qualify the part for uh, flight or uh, for putting it on the aircraft. So that is where uh, the real challenge is uh, with some of these customers. And uh, the lead times that are involved for certifying one part for flight is three to five years very easily. So, um, mm -hmm. so I think, uh, yes, design is a challenge, but I think uh, because design is still uh, on a computer, because design is still a low cost uh, activity, uh, it is still something that uh, the customers are very willing and very open to discussing. Uh, I think uh, the moment you shift towards uh, production and you start talking about qualification and certification and the quality aspects of of the part and it's it's um, uh, you know conformance to the acceptance standards with respect to repeatability and mechanical properties and other things i think that is where uh, uh, our customers are more and more uh, cautious and that is i think uh, 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 as big a hurdle uh, to cross to get that part into end use Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so yes, so uh, aerospace has been doing that uh, extensive evaluation of the technology quite well, and partners like Cyan would be a great uh, support for the, that evaluation itself. I think. Uh, so, uh, my my next question will be uh, with Dr. Ian, and as Dr. Ian is coming from uh, UK and uh, uh, I think one of the most experienced people in UK and last year itself i think one of the biggest sporting day in the global history uh the wimbledon the world cup final and uh, the formula one so i i would like to ask you as you are placed uniquely uh with the formula one companies uh, in the uk and you see a lot of a uh, lot of uh, formula one users and the technology has been adopted really well uh, with the Formula One teams, so how do you shrink the time, the part increase the part quality, and uh, increase the reliability of the component? How have you faced these questions with your customers, Dr. Ian? Dr. Ian, I think you have to unmute yourself. Dr. Ian, can you hear me? Hello, I think I've lost his voice. Uh, so again, like, uh, I think I'll move further to Ms. Paul. Um, regarding uh, the part screening and uh, these activities for your end customers, how do you uh, go forward with uh, design for additive manufacturing or using that same design for your customers and uh, selecting a right material for your customers? Mr. Paul, can you throw some light on that? Hello. Mr. Paul. Yes, I was muted, yes. sorry. Yes. Um, I, 
Well, it's quite different within plastics and metals, say, uh, because um, yeah, again, on spare parts, most of the time we are talking about small volumes, small quantity, not not uh, not the GE applications. Um, so uh, for 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 plastics, very, I mean, it's very rare to go for the topological optimization. Um, it makes sense from time to time to to do a design optimization. Uh, for design for manufacturing, I'll say, or and and a little bit of rate reduction, but the the this is a, a trade-off in between uh, engineering work, uh, engineering cost, and uh, and the cost savings on on the production, um, and which and which trade-off in plastics is is often uh, beneficiary to not doing any redesign on spare parts from our experience. Well, also on, on metal, it's it's pretty much the other way around uh, as. Um, as long as there is some ability to to reduce mass and optimize design and optimize the design for manufacturing, the potential savings usually are are, are way above the, the cost of uh, of uh, of the entering time. So so that that makes sense and, and we do it quite often. So for us, it's a it's an economical oh, okay. trade-off to be assessed uh, based on the geometry of the part. So, so can you can you un make us understand about uh, the software for the part screening which you have developed for with spare part 3D itself? So, can you just throw some light on that? Yeah, well, it's uh, we we kind of build a funnel to screen the parts, starting from the most available data uh, in the companies, because that's often one of the difficulties not to have a full PLM system with uh, with all the design and the CADs and uh, and everything, but to, Perfectly filled in. So what we what we screen usually first is based on metadata. Um, so the typology of parts. We build up clusters of parts, group of parts, by from functional perspectives. Um, so it ends up being types, part types, uh, what we call part types with similar characteristics, and for which we associate all the all the functional specifications, uh, going from uh, again as we mentioned, uh, mechanical temperature. Uh, Flame rate latency, uh, biocompatibility, whatever, whatever uh, you will have on a specific environment of fuse, and um, and and we select materials based on those those specifications. So we, we have automated uh, uh, selection of the materials and processes based on those selections, and uh, and then we narrow down the analysis based on uh, business casing. So again, looking at at the at the potential savings. As compared to once we've got a, a material selection, as compared to conventional, um, and and once we we go further down the phone and we have analyzed uh, this metadata to to have a first technical economic assessment, we we work on the 2Ds and 3Ds, and uh, so on the 3Ds we we uh, we, we go and uh, and look for the opportunity. I mean, we validate the printability of the different processes. We look for the opportunity for for the design for additive manufacturing. And potential cost savings uh, through that. Um, so it's it's kind of a, a different steps process, but that is uh, uh, that you can update and that can the entire analysis can be redone instantly on the soft uh, every time you add a new a new parameter, every time you add new new information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I next uh, I, I just want to come back to Dr. Ian uh, with the question. Um, because he has been serving one of the most unique customers, one of the most uniquest of the customers, the Formula One. And uh, so the turnaround time, the reliability, and the question of re uh, uh, realizing the component for, uh, with, with the unique kind of design. So Dr. Ian, can, can you throw some light uh, with experience with the Formula One? Hello. Dr. Ian is again not audible. I think there has been some issue with this. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll go back to uh, Arthur sir uh, on. Hello. How do you? Yes. Hello. Yes. Yes. Finally. Yes. Yeah, so there was a big, big problem with the. Um, System there. Okay, so uh, you wanted to know about uh, Formula One. So I think one of the key, one of the one of the really key points is the one that um, Arthur was making um, regarding partnership with the supplier. So everybody can gain by 
getting um, the supplier involved very early in the design and development process. So although you, you're actually involved with the whole project for quite a long time, when it comes to the point where the part is uh, really needed, you've done all of the hard work, you've designed for the process, you've tested out the, the difficult um, areas on for building the part um, and, and maybe build sections of the part. Um, and then when it's really needed, you can you can get on with it. Now the the Formula One teams started with uh, relatively simple parts, and in fact, the best benefits they got um, certainly even, even until relatively recently are largely exhaust parts. But they gradually mm -hmm. moved through. Um, in fact, this I think the first parts, some of the first really critical parts were roll hoops, and um, the simple roll hoops worked really well. The complex ones were a nightmare to build. But um, yeah, I would say the key thing is a uh, partnership between the service provider and the uh, the design team is um, absolutely essential. So just so, uh, so echoing was, what I said earlier. How was the turnaround time uh, being so crucial and how was uh, 3D uh, answering those questions? The, the turnaround time? Yes. So why why was it critical, did you say, or in what way, what did we do to reduce it, which was a question, sorry? Exactly, exactly. What way were you able to reduce it? Um, well, reducing the, the, the lead time, as I say, the, the design process tends to be uh, measured in, in uh, weeks and months, uh, but the, the bit that matters is that the design is available um, at the right point and that uh, both the supplier and the uh, design customer, uh, design team and the customer know exactly what is required from that in terms of uh, quality standards, finishing processes. So as with anything, the, the best way to be really fast is to be proactive and um, make okay. sure you've designed out the, the niggly areas that are going to cause uh, variability. Uh, raw hoop took a fantastic example. Um, some of the raw hoops that um, 3T made many years ago were uh, just the most awful things to try and build um, and in fact in one case the roll hoop um, was one unit of mass and the support structure trying to stop the roll hoop from ripping itself to pieces as uh, was 1.5 times so the supports were heavier greater mass of material than the roll hoop. Um, and that's all down exactly. to design. If you design with AM in, in mind, you can be really fast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so does that so answer your, your question? Uh, yes, yes. So, uh, so on your level, like, uh, how do you see the adoption from the industry if you go from top to bottom? Uh, so the automotive, the aerospace, the medical, because you have experience with all of them. So, so how have you seen? The questions changing, the profiling changing of the customers, and how how do you see uh, what kind of industry has been adopting really well? So you're talking about industries or within each company? So there's two different um, uh, two industry. different approaches. Sector, sector. Yes. Sectors. Okay. So yeah, in terms of industry sectors, probably aerospace were the very earliest um, of the major adopters. Um, from the point of view of metal anyway. Um, personally, I was in automotive and we were using stereolithography. Um, I uh, commissioned the very first stereolithography part in 1989 for um, mm -hmm. Rover Group. That was done on a, I think it was a SLA 190 or something. It was a tiny machine and even, a, even that part, which was only maybe um, 250 millimeters was made up in four pieces of very brittle um, stereolithography wow. resin. So um, aerospace were very advanced, but they have an they've got an incredibly long take-up curve. Um, mm -hmm. Interestingly, Formula One were very advanced. They did they all did polymer first, and um, aerospace moved into metal uh, in very different ways between, say, GE and uh, some of the UK and other manufacturers. But they all, it's all, its like anything, you, you, you don't see the gestation period. The gestation period can be maybe two decades and then suddenly it springs up. So I think bamboo is the, 
the classic where it can lie dormant. I think it's bamboo, correct me if I'm wrong. It lies dormant for a very long time, maybe, maybe years, um, but then when it does grow, it, it can go very fast. And that's fairly typical. So um, automotive is really up and coming, but the cost is a major barrier. Um, but there are quite a lot of parts running around on relatively small going road cars, particularly supercars, hypercars. Um, and then medical was quite an early adopter, but they tended to take it all in house um, to a very large extent, with the exception of the acetabular cups, where um, Arcam technology was was very popular because of its speed. Um, and uh, industrial applications, I think, is where it's very exciting. And at one point I would like to make is um, don't be afraid to take on boring parts. <laughs> so, <laughs> The boring, the boring bits are actually very often the most exciting. So my, my classic example is brackets. Yes. There's loads and loads and loads of brackets. Jigs and fixtures, David Wimpany mentioned in the uh, last uh, the last seminar. Brackets, jigs mm -hmm. and fixtures, they're not sexy. They're not, not exciting to look at. But my goodness, you can get huge benefits um, by using additive plastic and metal by, um, by going down that route. So, so you, the mundanes you are you are saying uh, try to work on the mundanes and the non-sexy part of the AM side, right? Don't 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 be af don't be afraid to go for the mundane, um, uh, because that in the end uh, it may be that the mundane bits of the are act, turn out to be the superstars. I'm not saying that that is always the case. Obviously, the sexy bits can also be fantastic. So, uh, turbochargers for uh, Formula One cars incredibly difficult to make, very sexy awesome parts um, mm -hmm. and very successful but uh, don't don't uh, don't turn away from the slightly duller parts exactly exactly so so my next question will be with uh, uh, Arthur sir uh, I just wanted to ask you like how is your customers journey from the prototyping to production and what kind of evaluation st uh, state checks you work with your customer because you uh, primarily work as a consultant to your customers and you take them through that journey so can can you explain about the evolution uh, with your customer itself yeah sure Ankit um, so I think uh, uh, we work with customers uh, uh, who are at different stages of uh, maturity level uh, when it comes to additive manufacturing technology so we work with customers who just started exploring this technology and are looking at those uh, uh, mundane parts that uh, Ian was mentioning uh, just now uh, as the first step of entering in, into this technology and seeing its benefits. And at the other end, we are working with customers who frankly are more advanced users of additive manufacturing than we are. So they have already certified parts, they have put them in flight and they need help uh, with with stuff that they don't want to do uh, uh, themselves and they need reliable partners say for example in helping them screening parts uh, so mm -hmm. so we work with customers who are at different uh, 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 readiness and maturity levels uh, in the additive manufacturing spectrum now the trends that we are seeing in our interaction with uh, all of these customers some are consistent and some are uh, some vary with respect to the customer and the industry in which they operate. Uh, but some consistent trends are, for, for example, even for prototyping, the customer's uh, requirements and expectations are quite high. The reason for that is some of the stakeholders that are coming to us with additive manufacturing projects are actually trying to sell this idea internally within their own organizations. So if the quality of the prototype is not, not that great, then they will not be able to do that. They will not be able to sell additive manufacturing within their organizations. So the expectation mm -hmm. level uh, from prototypes as well uh, has, has gone up. With respect to mm -hmm. production, I think uh, more and more customers are consistently asking for evidence of expertise. Now, this can be in terms of examples of the previous work that we have done, but more frequently we are seeing that this is in terms of uh, a proper uh, demonstration of the machine and process consistency by doing coupons and by planning test builds and then making sure that uh, 
the values that we see for our test coupons are falling within a range and falling within a range consistently. So I think these kind of uh, qualifications are becoming the norm before the customer actually gives you a, a, a part for production using additive manufacturing. Then uh, mm -hmm. other thing I wanted to mention was, uh, uh, we talked about customers who are just exploring uh, additive manufacturing. So for customers at this end of the spectrum, it is very, very important uh, that a supplier or a, or a partner to these customers takes the role of an educator as well. Because many mm -hmm. times your, your customer would come to you with an expectation, expectation of an injection molded part or maybe the surface finish of an injection molded part, but expecting the part to be delivered at the cost of a FDM part, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, similarly, they would have, uh, I remember one, uh, this, this was not a customer, but an internal stakeholder. When they had a look uh, for the first time of, uh, at an additively manufactured part, a metal part, they were like, oh, this is the surface finish that you get. Uh, this is not that great. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> So you need to play the role of an educator also to these customers so that you explain the, the benefits and constraints of each of the technology and you help them choose the right technology for their application. And I think this involves a lot of uh, discussion with the customers. And last point that I want to mention is needless of uh, or at what stage your customers are in their maturity level, it is very important for you as their partner uh, to listen because mm -hmm. many times we we focus on the evident and we forget something that is not evident for example the customer can come to you and say that hey manufacture this part for me uh, using additive manufacturing in metal but then unless you understand the end application of the part unless you understand the the environment in which it operates you will not be able to help the customer derive uh, the maximum value out of that particular application. So I think it is very important that uh, the partners listen to the customers and uh, nudge them by asking questions and trying to elicit those unsaid requirements that the customer may not have, uh, you know, um, on the top of their mind, but which are very, very important from uh, deciding the right course of uh, uh, additive manufacturing technology for producing that end use part. Did that answer your question, Ank? Yes, yes. Uh, so, so I I would uh, like to start with uh, Mr. Paul. Thank, thank you, Professor. Uh, Mr. Paul, uh, any clo closing comment uh, on today's webinar? So, actually, we are just overshooting the time uh, allotted for this. Um, yes, a few comments on the last uh, the last uh, info provided or last uh, insight provided by uh, Yain and Nata. Uh, um, on the incubation time uh, within companies, uh, I just go, want to give uh, to give uh, my my experience. My, my former role before uh, before doing spare part 3D, I was strategy consultant and uh, working with a major OEM uh, in aerospace. And we plan ahead to change completely the engineering organization uh, uh, to merge the design and stress teams to be able to for them to integrate massively additive manufacturing within their supply chain. Um, and their design know-how, yeah, and so this is this hasn't been seen yet, but that's a change we made five years ago uh, for the next mm -hmm. generation of aircraft. So you have you have industries that are that knows uh, the time is is, is uh, that are working long term, and effectively certification is is a real constraint in this area. But uh, the incubation sometimes is not uh, you don't see it, but it's going it's going forward. Um, after that, my other comment is. Uh, um, we, we see, and we've been talking mostly about uh, end-use products uh, in the discussion. We are seeing exactly the same trend uh, where uh, our customers are being much more um, focused towards uh, repeatability of the production, uh, demonstration of the supply uh, capabilities uh, in terms of process control and, uh, and uh, ability to deliver consistent parts. Uh, I think that's, that's a big area of, uh, of uh, improvement for for AM as a whole, and uh, and uh, that uh, the, this is a, a key concern to be to be to, to question when uh, when when you are doing uh, end use production of parts as a customer. That's all. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you, Mr. Paul. Uh, Dr. Ian, uh, any closing comment uh, for today's webinar on the topic on the uh, on the audience itself? 
Uh, well, firstly, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to take part in the in the webinar. It's been very interesting. Um, some great answers by uh, the uh, co-panelists, so thank you very much for that. I very much uh, agree uh, with uh, uh, the, uh, the life cycle side of things. Um, and I just uh, final word really is um, take you know, to suggest that people take their time. Um, don't be in too big a rush. Uh, make sure you get a good partnership, um, as uh, as has uh, been emphasising. Um, and uh, have fun. Make sure it works. All the best. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ian. Arthur, sir, uh, any closing comment for today's uh, session itself? Yeah. Um, thank you, Ankit, uh, for inviting me and allowing Scient to play a small part in today's uh, uh, webinar. I think uh, uh, coming back to the topic of the webinar, how to be an a informed AM buyer, I think uh, for someone who is starting out uh, off on this uh, journey, uh, it is. I think they would be okay if they stick to uh, 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 some common sense decisions that they would apply for uh, conventional sourcing as well, with uh, the added caveats that for additive manufacturing, the field is rapidly evolving. So it is very important to identify a, a trusted partner or maybe a couple of those who can who can be your trusted advisors in trying to help you navigate the different technologies, the different materials, and different applications of additive manufacturing because i don't think uh, if you're looking at accelerated adoption of am you don't need to uh, invent the wheel uh, from the start you can rely on the expertise of others and help them accelerate your maturity at a much much faster pace so with that i think i would like to close oh, okay uh, thank you everyone thank you for joining us uh, today thank you dr ian thank you mr paul thank you uh, mr atta uh, it was a great pleasure talking to you guys and i would like to thank uh, 3dprint.com which uh, which who is our media partner for uh, these events and association partner tagmy india uh, who has been helping us uh, grow the knowledge about additive manufacturing within the country itself and uh, we are proud members of uh, tagma um and uh, i i would really uh, like to move forward with uh, today's topic and i think it might be some insight for the audience today uh, on the topic itself and it was a great pleasure hosting you guys uh, thank you so much do join us on our second uh, webinar on the 23rd it will be on the pre and the post processing uh, of the additive technologies again we'll be having three panelists uh, one will be from dimension which is a uh, post processing company uh, for for uh, polymer parts the second will be from materialize which has been like uh, like uh, the super brand of additive manufacturing for uh, uh, the pre processing of the data and the third will be uh, deepa shrinivasan ma'am uh, she has been uh, a great uh, support for the indian audience and uh, trying to adopt about the additive technologies so we'll be talking more about heat treatments and the post processing requirements uh, for for the for additive manufacturing itself thank you very much for uh, attending today's webinar thank you dr ian thank you mr paul thank you Atha, sir, uh, for 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 being such a great panelist and having such a great patience with us thank you so much thank you very much ankit it was a pleasure thank you thank you very much thank you everyone thank you thank you bye bye thank you bye bye, bye. bye, -bye. Mm -hmm.